Emergency Medical Minute presents Pharmacy Friday, where emergency medicine clinical pharmacists join us to shed light on pharmacological topics. I'm Elizabeth Esty. We're here today to talk about the Colorado Pharmacist Society 2020 Opioid Prescribing and Treatment Guidelines. We're so happy to have with us today Rachel Duncan. Rachel is a clinical pharmacist who has extensive experience working in the ED and ICU settings. She's been at Swedish Medical Center for quite a long time, and she also recently has begun a practice at the Heart of the Rockies Regional Medical Center, where she works as a pharmacist in the outpatient department, and she also manages the 340B drug pricing program for that hospital. Clearly, Rachel has wide experience in a number of practice settings for pharmacists. Rachel, you were one of the key players in the Alto movement in Colorado emergency departments. 2017, tell us how you got into this. I guess actually practicing in the emergency department is what opened my eyes to the opioid crisis. And before I had only been really working in the intensive care unit setting, which opioids just look a lot different there. A lot of times you're focused more on sedation as much as pain. Um, So switching to the emergency room atmosphere in 2015 really opened my eyes. I saw a lot of folks coming in, not just post heroin overdose, but a lot from prescription opioids too. And it also opened my eyes to how we were over for prescribing opioids. And so along with uh, my ph- a physician champion, Dr. Don Stater, who is a, an editor on all of these guidelines and a, and a leader in this project in the state, um, we did a small pilot at our own hospital ER looking at if we used altos for pain instead of opioids, would we still be able to keep folks comfortable and keep them satisfied? And so we did that study in 2016 and published it in late 2018 um, that really showed that, yes, you could use altos more than opioids and still appropriately treat pain from the emergency room setting. Um, From there, we were heavily involved with the Colorado Hospital Association, um, just expanding that pilot program into all of the ERs in Colorado throughout 2018 and 2019. And from there, that really led to, if we can do this in an, an acute setting like the emergency room, that's great, but we need to affect this from all settings. So we can't just have change in one area. Um, patients are exposed to opioids in all realms of medicine, inpatient, outpatient, um, and in the clinic. And so uh, could we apply these four basic principles of limiting opioids using alternatives, harm reduction, um, and treatment of opioid use disorder um, from every setting. And that's really what led to the Colorado's Cure project and concept of transferring what we'd done in the emergency room with those Colorado um, chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians 2017 guidelines um, and expanding those into, I mean, really any um, medical specialty in the state of Colorado, um, including the Colorado Pharmacist Society. Clinicians united to resolve the epidemic. Absolutely. (laughs) What would Don say? Don Stater would say, the only way we're getting out of this is together. Absolutely. And I, and I completely agree. And, and we felt from the beginning that while pharmacists were involved in each of those various settings, along with the providers, um, we also wanted to write these guidelines specifically for pharmacist as well. And so the CPS guidelines were born. Rachel, thanks for being here today. Could you tell us a little bit about what these 2020 opioid prescribing and treatment guidelines are and how you got involved in this project? Yeah, thanks for having me today. It is wonderful to be in studio to chat about these very important and Um, pertinent guidelines, especially as we look at the numbers coming in from 2020 with the opioid crisis and how COVID has affected that. So I just think it's even more relevant now. I got involved in these early in 2020. Um, A member of Colorado Pharmacist Society, Dr. Sarah Wettergreen, reached out to me and was spearheading the subcommittee for um, CPS and just asked with my experience with opioid stewardship 
leadership and my experience at the state level, if I would want to co-chair that committee with her. Um, everyone here is somewhat familiar with Colorado's Cure, um, but we, uh, along with all of the different statewide subspecialty guidelines, we also felt it was very important for pharmacists to also have their own guidelines. And so it's important to note that pharmacists were heavily involved in all of the other Colorado's Cure guidelines, particularly when it came to talking about other forms of pain control besides opioids. Um, so for the surgical guidelines, the inpatient, the OCMED, um, just a pharmacist was involved in all of those. Um, but beyond that, we really just wanted to have guidelines for pharmacy and really look at all the different settings. And as you mentioned, I've worked in a few different settings in the inpatient side. I now work in the outpatient side, uh, um, as well as with the 340B drug pricing program. Um, Dr. Wettergreen brings uh, an extensive background in the ambulatory care setting, which is huge um, when you look at opioid stewardship. She is also a professor at university, so she's in the academic setting. So we really felt like between the two of us, we could bring a lot of different perspectives to the table. Along with that, we put together um, this subcommittee with various CPS members who were in different settings. And so I did want to briefly recognize those members. It was Jennifer Biltoft, Neil Hurst, Ryan Leyland, Jody Adams, Toral Patel, Rihanna Fink, Chris Stock, Will Gersh, and Brandon Utter. And so it was definitely a team effort to come together and say, hey, how should we be um, – prescribing opioids in 2020 and treating opioid use disorder, um, and how can pharmacy be in, more heavily involved in that and really be helping out our prescribers in the state. Um, and so um, with along with those members, we spent about six months looking at the four different pillars, which have been a part of all of the Colorado's Cure guidelines, and looked at how can pharmacists be involved in number one, limiting opioids, so just step one. Number two, if we're going to limit opioids, what are we going to use for pain control? And that's really what a pharmacist jam is, right, is to how can we use what we call alternatives to opioids or altos, as well as non-pharmacologic agents to treat pain. Um, the third part is harm reduction. Pharmacists are in a prime position to be more involved in harm reduction. And then the fourth pillar, which is so important, is treatment of opioid use disorder. And again, um, pharmacists can be at the forefront of this. And so it was really great to get these wonderful minds together and and write these guidelines. We're really proud of them. And they can be seen in their entirety on the Colorado Hospital Association website. And we'll certainly put the link to the guidelines in the show notes here. It's, you know, at, before we came into the studio today, I looked over the guidelines and it was such a, such a strange experience to see this product of a, of a time before COVID. Yes. When, you know, there was a sense that and there, it is true that people like you guys and, and all of the people involved in all of these Colorado's Cure guidelines, there was a real sense of optimism and, and efficacy in what we were doing. Uh, and now we know that COVID has just set us back in, in a big way. And the rates of opioid-related deaths are, are skyrocketing because of COVID. So... These guidelines are just as important, if not more important, than they than they ever were. For our listeners who who don't know these guidelines at all, you know, go look at them on the on the website. But I'd like to um, structure wh what we talk about today through those four pillars because they really are um, common to all these cures guidelines, and they'll help organize our conversation. They are just to recap what you said: limiting the use of opioids in clinical practice using multimodal alternative to opioid for treating pain, better ways to treat pain, less dangerous ways to treat pain, harm reduction, and we'll talk about really what that is. And then finally, how do we help people who, who have become addicted to opioids? So Rachel, let's talk about that first pillar, limiting opioids in practice. What are some of the basic principles you think about when you think about prescribing and use yeah, but I think the first place that we all have to start, whether you're a pharmacist or a provider or just somewhere in the medical practice, is recognizing that opioids are dangerous drugs. 
Um, they come with a lot of inherent risks, not only with various concerning side effects, something as simple as nausea and vomiting to um, constipation, which can be very significant in you know, post-operative patients who are taking those around the clock and then end up back in the ER because they haven't pooped in a week, <laughs> um, all the way up to something much more serious like respiratory depression, overdose, and death. And so as we all go into healthcare, we take this oath to do no harm. And so if we recognize that opiates are dangerous drugs, hopefully it's giving us a pause before we do prescribe or fill those medications and really make us more thoughtful about when are they actually appropriate. And if we can avoid them at all possible, we are definitely validated in doing so just by recognizing the harm that it can cause. Um, and so that's really, I think, the number one place to start with limiting opioids is just recognizing, hey, these are these are dangerous drugs. Let's treat them with the respect they deserve and try to avoid them whenever possible. Of course, in all of your practice settings, you're going to have patients who come in who are on chronic opioid therapy or have an acute injury that, that really, they, they warrant a prescription of an of a opioid. What is the special role of the pharmacist in, in those situations? I think pharmacists just bring such a unique knowledge of all of the chemistry and, and pharmacokinetics that, that go into the various types of opioids and so can really help um, providers pinpoint which one would be appropriate for that patient. And that knowledge also becomes very important with those patients you inherit that have been on chronic opioids for decades because that's really all providers were ever taught in school, pain equals an opioid. And so we, we do have a lot of patients um, that, that are on around-the-clock opioids and have been for many years. And so I think the knowledge that pharmacists can bring and really help is to assist prescribers in understanding relative potencies of those different opioid medications, and that allows them to be able to help those providers maybe transition patients to a safer agent. And so at this point, I think we know nuances of some of these that should not be used in certain patient populations. For example, morphine is renally cleared. If you have a patient that is elderly with um, increasingly poor renal function, we probably need to transition them to a different agent. We also have a lot of folks becoming more open-minded of transitioning their chronic pain therapy from one of the classic opioids, let's say, you know, MS cotton, oxycotton, Percocet, whatever that might be, to a much safer agent of buprenorphine, which I think historically we've thought of as treatment for opioid use disorder, which it is, but can also be a great long-term chronic pain agent. And so I think pharmacists, again, can provide that assistance to our clinicians when transitioning patients to a safer agent like buprenorphine. Um, and so that's definitely one of the pieces we have in these guidelines is, hey, call your pharmacist. They have the specialized knowledge. You don't have to try to transition patients um, between agents um, without that help. I think we can be very helpful. The second piece of that that's really we're getting a lot more information and research out about in the past decade is pharmacogenomics. And this is one that I'm actually not very knowledgeable about. We were able to get a couple of, of great doctors, uh, pharmacy in on this, Yi Ming Li and Ina Liko, who were able to really help us put together within these guidelines a very valuable appendix that talks about how pharmacogenomics can can affect various opioids, whether that's metabolism to its active product, it makes it more or less effective, or metabolism out of the body, which can, of course, um, affect things like side effects. And so if you do have a patient who's not doing well with the current agent for their chronic pain, um, either they're having unacceptable side effects that you just wouldn't really expect from that dose of that agent, or they're just not even reaching any type of effect with that. It's, I think, important to keep in the back of your mind that pharmacogenomics could be really helpful for certain patients. 
And really the enzyme that we think about for a lot of these agents is the CYP2D6. And without getting into too much detail, because as I mentioned, Dr. Lee and Dr. Liko put a wonderful appendix in these guidelines for you to reference. If you are seeing no efficacy or side effects that you really didn't expect, it may be reasonable to do testing on that patient and just see if they have a polymorphism at that CYP2D6 um, enzyme. So beyond those two specialized knowledge um, ways that we can help optimize um, the opioids in those patients that do require them, other things that I think of keeping patients safe who are taking opioids are, one, making sure we're doing a lot of education about opioid medication safety, including risks of side effects and risk of misuse, and making sure that patients are fully aware of that. I think we play an important role in safe storage and disposal of opioids as unused opioids laying around in cabinets is not good for anyone involved. Either someone will find those opioids because they want to or on accident. And so when I'm talking to patients about safe disposal and they, you know, maybe blow me off a little bit, I talk to them, well, what about your grandchild or your dog got into these or a visitor that's in your house that you don't know has an undiagnosed opioid use disorder? That is when you are going to wish that you had stored these in a locked place. And then if they were unused, that you got rid of them in a safe way. Um, And so we talk about that a lot in the guidelines. We also talk about pharmacies becoming um, safe disposal sites. And so a lot of counties have drop boxes now. Public health departments are doing things like that. And while we we don't want to necessarily require every retail pharmacy to be a safe disposal site because there there is a lot of paperwork behind that, um, I think the more accessibility patients can have to get safely get rid of those unused opioids is so key. and and keeping patients and the population safe. And then the last little piece I think about with those patients that we talked about, you inherit that have been on chronic opioid therapy for decades, and you're looking at now an 80-year-old female with multiple comorbidities getting that same dose of opioid that she did maybe when she started or got to after multiple spinal fusions when she was 50, all of a sudden it doesn't look as safe in that patient. And we know about those harms. And so I think the last piece of this is that pharmacists have a lot of knowledge where they could help providers do really good taper strategies. And tapers are so hard for patients, especially those that have been on opioids long-term. Their receptors look totally different. Their physiology acts totally different with these opioids. We have to be very thoughtful and careful about how we do opioid tapering. And think of those patients who have been co-prescribed an opioid and a benzo for decades again. And this is what we deal with a lot of times in the retail and outpatient setting is you're getting those flags of, yep, they're on a um, concomitant opioid and benzo. We all have to acknowledge it's dangerous. We all have to put in prior authorizations at this point to even get those scripts to go through. But what if we could be reaching out to providers or they could know that we are this wonderful resource to be able to help facilitate tapering of opioids or either agent and how to do that safely and get the patient on board and to manage some of maybe the the side effects that they would feel from that. Um, And so those are just some of the ways that when I think about, hey, opioids are always going to be there and be a part of therapy, how can we make sure that those that are using them are, are kept as safe as possible? That's fascinating. And and I, I remember reading in the guideline that the average patient will have contact with his or her pharmacist, outpatient pharmacist, up to 10 times more often than they see their primary care provider. And it seems like the pharmacist could be a natural, uh, important partner in, in a taper strategy like that. Do you know if that's happening? Are there pharmacists who are really engaging in these sorts of ongoing taper experiences with patients? 
Absolutely. I think some pharmacists that are in a dedicated ambulatory care type setting are probably the first that I think about who are already in that workflow with providers, especially if you're associated with a pain clinic who can very much be helping transition to a safer agent like buprenorphine or helping to go about safely tapering patients. I think there's huge potential for just our classic outpatient pharmacists working in the retail setting to do community outreach to their local providers or offices saying, hey, I do have this knowledge. I would be happy to partner with you. Um, I just think we have to get that um, out there for providers to know that it is and then close the loop and constantly make sure that that patient, no matter where they're going within their healthcare setting, is hearing the same message. I think that's so important when you approach something like opioid tapering. Yeah, I I have to second the the your recommendation to read the pharmacogenomic parts of the guideline. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. It is, and it makes you realize too, or it makes me realize that you know we use the word opioid or opiates, but these medications are sneakily different and very. And um, things can go terribly wrong. You know, you have somebody on methadone, and you're messing around, or the doc is messing around with doses or adding on other medications that interact, you need your pharmacist for for some of these tricky moments. Absolutely. I I can't agree more. And as I mentioned, I totally admit to not being an expert with the pharmacogenomic thing. Um, But that's why we have really smart people who know a lot about that, that we roped into helping us with that section. And and I would really encourage you to check out that appendix. And I think it would it would change your practice um, and to just put that on your radar um, for when to recommend that, because it's not an inexpensive thing. It's like we don't do this routinely on every patient, but it walks you through when would be those triggers for you to say, hey, I think this is reasonable and we should test this patient. And it alerts you to the meds that are are the most problematic. I think it was codeine and... Yep. Tramadol, morphine. Yep. 